Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> How's everyone doing out there? All right, let me just... Uh... Yeah, it looks all right. Cool. <clears throat> Excuse me. How's everyone doing? Uh, I was out filming today. <laughs> I just ran inside for the live stream. So welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, weed management today. Um, we were talking about pest management last time. Hope you got a chance to check out the module uh, on Thursday. Um, I sort of wrapped up everything to do with weed management. So like usual, we will take questions on the topic, which is about um, weed management, and then open up for general questions. So before we get into it, though, just as usual, huge thanks to PaperPot Co. for sponsoring the course and these live streams. I couldn't do it without them, and uh, their generosity and support is just really unmatched and um, making this course possible, which a lot of people have been um, have been uh, really enjoying, and so that's really cool. So um, a big thanks to them. And go check out what Diego has for podcasts like Farm Small, Farm Smart, and uh, Carrot Cash Flow. Also Diego's YouTube channel, lots of good content on there too. And uh, go check out what they have for sale. Let them know you're appreciating the course, and um, that would be really cool. Anyways. Let's get on to talking about questions. I hate wasting people's time. You guys know I get to the point. So, um, but we'll wait for a couple of people to uh, to jump in here. We got some people from all over the place. Very cool. All right. So, what's new with me? Uh, let me just do talk about that, and then we'll we'll get into questions. So, uh, yeah, season's really wrapping up. I have uh, my second to last delivery this week, and then. Um, and then next week will be the last week, and that's it. So really, things are winding down here. We're going to start putting the beds to sleep soon. Um, we've got a break in the heat for like a few days, and then it's just going to get hot again. So it's been – summer's here. I'm um, looking forward to the break. So anyways, let me get some questions in. Thanks, truck boy. Uh, the last module, module 15, and the live was all about pest management. So go check that one out. It was last week, module 15. <clears throat> hey, Inger. Hey, Johnson. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I posted that. I don't know if you saw my post or if you saw uh, the Acres USA magazine that's coming out in July. It's, I'm on the cover, which is like <laughs> so crazy. I, I have to say, for those of you who've been following my channel for a while or, you know, we've interacted or whatever, like this whole thing is just crazy to me that so many people are interested in this little farm that I that I started in my backyard. So it's just wild. So thank you. Um it's uh, it's pretty crazy. So if you're curious about that, Acres is a organization that's been around for a long time. They put out a monthly um, magazine as well, um, and the article that's in there is actually a, basically a transcript of a podcast that I did with Diego in like January or February, uh, and it was about like my farming practices and stuff, and then like about the course that was just we were just getting going. So if you're curious about it, but it was it was a it was a huge honor. I'm like just totally just totally blown away. Uh, that's pretty crazy. Um, all right. Hey, Wesley from Holland, uh, South Louisiana. <laughs> Thanks, Blake. Yeah, it's just crazy. I just, oh, man. I, I don't know. I'll just give you guys, I'll give you everyone a few minutes to come in here. Get, get your questions in about um, about pests because that's what we're going to talk about first. Um, <laughs> uh you got, if you don't know my background, so I started the farm kind of by accident. I just wanted to start like growing vegetables for the family. We started with chickens first and then growing some veggies. And then um, I started marketing the farm on Instagram and I started getting more and more questions. And so I wanted to do long form content after a year of doing short form content. And then um, I wound up, um, this looks a little dark now. <clears throat> Sorry, I can't help with playing with the camera. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I started the YouTube channel and pretty quickly I got a viral video and it blew up and then it became like this whole thing. And I just can't believe how many people follow me on, on YouTube. I just, I don't know. It's just, it's very humbling. So thanks for everyone for the support and like things like this happen and like I don't expect them and it's pretty crazy. So very cool. Okay. 
All right. So let me give you a quick rundown about my um, my weed management style because it's I think it's different than a lot of things that you see out there because most people are reacting to weeds instead of being proactive with weeds. And so that's a big shift. And so it's kind of in line with most things I talk about on the course and that it's about systems and planning and getting things set up ahead of time so they're not wasting time, energy, labor, resources, brain space down the road for dealing with stuff you shouldn't have to deal with during the season. And weeds is one of those things. So the biggest thing is to tarp the ground until things are dead. So literally until everything is dead. So it could take three months, it could take nine months, uh, depending on the time of year, what's growing. Just tarp it until everything is dead. And if you pull it off and things aren't dead and you start planting or you build beds on top of it, all that stuff's going to grow through it. And I really can't stress this enough. And I've I've made this mistake a few times. Um, some were conscious, some were just learning. Um, first of which was the first tunnel at Raleigh City Farm. We just needed to get stuff growing. We didn't have time to tarp. So we just hand pulled as much as we could, and then we built beds. And within a few months, once the summer temperatures kicked in and we were watering pretty regularly because we were growing vegetables there, the weeds started coming through and they were fierce and we had to make adjustments. Um, out in the field at Raleigh City Farm, we really didn't have a lot of weed pressure because we had tarped pretty much pretty well before we built beds, and that was great. Here on my farm now, the first two tunnels, I didn't tarp because again, I was rushing it. I used chickens because it was in the winter time and I had chickens. Um, the chickens will clear land a lot faster in the winter when you don't have heat and sun to do it. But the third tunnel, we actually tarp for an extended period of time. And there are like no weeds in there. Like even after the end of the summer, there's like very little weeds in there. Um, the first two tunnels, are, they are, there is a good amount of weed pressure in there uh, that we're having to manage now. And so that's another big thing about me pausing my farm over the summer is of course because I'm taking the summer off but also the fact that I'm going to tarp my tunnels for the summer so it will kill everything and then I can come back in the fall and plant and not have weeds I won't have any weeds all winter um, because it will have an extended tarping period it'll also be a very warm time of the year so they'll get lots of heat on the ground and it'll it'll heat up and, and everything that it'll, that'll try to grow will die <clears throat> so that's the big thing is tarping till everything's dead and then not disturbing the soil because when you disturb the soil, when you, let's say, rototill or plow it or anything like that where you're bringing, you're inverting the soil, that's when um, you're going to have issues with weeds coming to the surface and germinating and growing. And you see this on every tillage farm. They come through and plow in the spring, they plant, and then they have weeds all season because they're just tilling up the, the seeds. They get to the surface, they germinate, and then they grow. So if we kill everything, don't disturb the surface, and then build beds, beds on top using the methods we talked about, like deep compost, mulch system, lasagna beds, those sorts of things, um, you really have low weed pressure. And if you have an area that gets out of control, like, for example, my top two tunnels, they're not out of control, but there is weed pressure in there, just tarp them. You can tarp individual beds. You can tarp them with a piece of landscape fabric, or you can tarp them with um, a strip of silage tarp. Um, and just get the weeds under control and then plant and just don't disturb the soil. So that's the strategy. Um, I don't use pesticides. I try not to hand pull very many weeds. Uh, in addition to that, once you get them under control, um, you can lightly cultivate them before there are weeds or when the weeds are really tiny, they call them like thread stage weeds. And you just come through them and lightly hit them with a, a syrup hoe or uh, not a syrup hoe, a collinear hoe or wire weeder. And just kind of like hit the surface and it'll disturb any of those weeds that just started growing. And then your farm looks totally clean. And so that's a lot of the strategy with you see these farms that are um, really immaculate uh, for the no-till farms. I mean, that's basically what people are doing um, is getting them under control and then not disturbing the soil and then constant um, cultivation. And a lot of those farms have, you know, have a lot of people working there so they can have people out there cultivating all the time. But as I said, in the, in the module... Um, we did the whole quarter acre field block and two people would take about 45 minutes once a week. So that's an hour and a half, maybe two hours at most of labor between the two of them um, to cultivate the field and not have any weeds on a quarter acre. It's not a lot of labor and it's like standing upright. I'm not, they're not leaning over pulling weeds. They're upright using a, a, a collinear hoe or a wire weeder. So that's the strategy. It's, it works well. Um, it's one of those things I said, you have to be ahead of it. You have to plan and you have to be, diligent about it and and it works so all right let me know what questions you guys have um sorry i was just kind of ra consolidating the module if, in case some of you hadn't seen it but uh it's been sort of my strategy 
Hey, let's see. Analog Pastor. Awesome. Awesome Garden. Thanks for coming. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good in order. Uh, as long as you watch the module, you probably learned everything you need to learn. But here, ask some questions. <clears throat> all right. Uh, what can I use to kill crabgrass? Taking over my purple hull peas. I was hoping for army worm. So again, Kenny, um, this doesn't fall into like what I do. So, you know, people come to me with, like I said, this is very similar to my pest strategy. And in fact, when I made, I made a video, it was in 2020 about, it was called like tackling farming's biggest challenges. And it's about pests and weeds. And I made that video together because it's a very similar strategy for me. It's kind of like you plan ahead. You don't fight the symptom. You try to go after the cause. So when there already are weeds there, you know, we should have taken care of that a while ago. That doesn't negate the fact that you have an issue you need to deal with right now. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. Um, but I don't have anything I can just add that'll kill weeds because anything that you add, because I don't use any pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, will harm something else. So the best thing you can do is to pull as much as you can and then cover the surface with something. You can cover it with, if you're doing uh, purple hull peas, are they in one single row? Could you like put landscape fabric on either side of it and just put it up really close to the base of the plant? That could help. Um, you could try to pull as much as you can and then and then mulch with straw or something like that to try to minimize it a little bit. Um, you can flame weed if you can if you can use a, a flame weeder if you can keep it away from your crops that can sort of help um, kill some of the plants easily. Uh, so there are some options, but generally the the the, the point here is that we're going to try to uh, to plan ahead and not have them so we don't have to deal with that. So Kenny, that that's what I have to say about like having the issue right now um, and how to manage it. Um, I mean, the other question I have is, you know, with weeds, you know, the, the, when you have weeds, like sometimes they can affect the crop growth. Sometimes they don't. So that, that'll depend as well. If it's just ugly and it's stressing you out, that's one thing that can, your mental health, of course, you have to remember. Uh, but maybe they'll, they'll be fine and maybe you just have to deal with it and just keep, maybe you have to cut them down, cut down the weeds or pull them or whatever. Um, but yeah, crabgrass is, yeah, crabgrass is, is hardcore. So that would be something that if it's just one bed, that's really bad. I'd probably, when the peas are done, um, I'd probably cover that bed with landscape fabric until all the crabgrass was, was dead or that field block or whatever. And then when it is, then you can reuse that bed. Um, that would be what I would do. But if it's already taken over, I mean, there's not much you can do at this point other than try to manage it as best as possible. Yes. So, uh, do your weeds go to seed only when they're fully grown? So I, every plant is going to have a different cycle and I don't know that much about that. Also it depends on what's growing there, but, um, I mean, you see like grass that's growing, like after a while it'll, it'll flower and seed. So it's part of the cycle for sure. So I don't know if it's full grown, but, um, generally it's not when they're tiny. So after they've been growing for quite a bit. Hey, Johnson. So, yeah, so this is a good point, and I don't know if I know enough to really comment about it, but um, some people will say that, yes, yeah, certain weeds are there because there's a deficiency. Now, I do believe that nature will try to correct itself, and you see this when, you, when land gets cleared. You'll see certain species come in first, and then different species. There's a lot of talk about this in permaculture and land design and, and stuff like that and regenerating forests and all that kind of stuff. So sometimes the weeds that you see will tell you like what's going on in the soil. I don't know enough about it to, to tell you that. But what I do know is that the expression I've heard is mother nature is modest. She likes to keep herself covered. So if land gets cleared, things will grow. Like, so, you know, or as Jeff Goldblum would say, like life will find a way, right? So like... It will get covered. And so, you know, for example, like my lawn in the front, like I don't plant grass, I don't water it, I don't fertilize it, like I mow it every once in a while, I have the worst lawn in the neighborhood. But when it, when there's a drought, I have the only green lawn. So it's the stuff that survives that, that wants to be there. Um, so there's something for that too. But when we're, we're working on farming or agriculture or gardening, this is not a natural process. We're getting in the way of what's going on. 
And so we need to inter- we need to have a way to protect ourselves from what's going to happen naturally and work around that with minimal labor. And so that's where a lot of these strategies come in because if you just go plant stuff, like other things will grow, we'll compete with it, right? It's not like if I go out and plant a row of um, squash, those don't normally just grow here. There's other things that grow here. So we have to keep off that competition if it's weeds, if it's pests, um, weather that the plants don't like, all those kinds of things. We're doing something that's not part of the natural cycle in our context. So that's kind of how I, have to th- how I think about it for sure. But the more we can be in tune with what's going on, I think the better um, and trying to not harm the harm the soil. Yes, Kenny, good point. All right, so two acres of brown top millet two years ago. Uh, there's so much seed in the ground, it keeps coming every year. Yeah, millet grows real fast. Um, I don't know if you're using it for a cover crop or or you're growing it for whatever, but yeah, that's the other thing is that if you, you – for me, a lot of the time, the weed is not necessarily like grass and things like that. A lot of times my weeds, in the, in the areas that are well-controlled that I've tarped, the weeds are generally former crops like millet or – in the, in Kenny's case here, millet, or for my case, like I'll see kale coming up or a carrot or tatsoi or, you know, something that was planted. There was one bed that I had planted with mustard and like it started growing like 10 months later. I was like, how is that even possible? So if you have an area that keeps coming up, the best thing you can do is to either till it or at least rough the surface somehow, um, or not, you don't have to, but I would probably wet it really heavy and then cover it with a tarp. And if you do that, it'll force germinate all those seeds that are in the ground and they won't have a chance to grow. They won't have a chance to reproduce into more seeds and they'll die. And then you come back in and not disturb the soil and you should be good. Uh, tilling can definitely encourage that too. So if you think there are seeds in the first couple inches, if you stir up the first few inches, get it wet and then cover with a tarp, again, germinate, grow, die, there won't be any more seeds in the ground. So if you sort of force that germination, that's part of that occultation process. So this gets tricky because you're talking about two acres here. So that's a lot of land. That would be a lot of tarping. Um, I don't know, can you, move, can you move animals through there? Anything you can do to like force the germination and then terminate it, I think is, is important before it starts to go to seed. So there's a few ways around that, but two acres is definitely more than my, my wheelhouse. <laughs> it's a lot of tarps. Um, Nora, I don't, uh, maybe I don't really, the question is if, you, if the weed is annual or perennial, I don't really think about the difference. I, they're all the same to me. Like I kill them once they're dead, I move on. Um, the perennial weeds generally are harder to kill. A lot of them are rhizomous, uh, right? They have a rhizome, they grow under the ground. They're much harder to kill. So those will take longer in terms of tarping. Um, annual ones are ones that usually... They either blow in um, or on the surface or they're a little bit easier to kill. So I guess in that regard, I'm making a very general statement. I'm sure there's there's um, exceptions for both of those. Um, but yeah, as I said, tarp it until it's dead. All right, Blake says, tarping is great, but if you don't have the budget for one, you can cut the sod and it works great too. Okay. Yeah. I Yeah, I've never even thought about that, but I guess you could do that too. Um, problem is most of your good soil is in the first few inches, so I probably want to keep that unless your soil is just totally garbage, but that takes a lot of labor. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much that costs or what that really involves. But yeah, that could be a good way to, to kill grass probably pretty quickly. If you if you can't afford silage tarps, um, I've heard people using old billboard signs. I don't know. I don't know if that's still a strategy, but I've heard people doing that. Maybe you can find them cheaper. Yeah, crabgrass. <laughs> Yep. As I said, if an area gets out of control, you just got to cover it and you just got to wait it out until it's dead. <clears throat> yeah, some of these weeds are bad and, and it gets um, 
it gets demoralizing because you'll go out and you'll spend time leaned over weeding, like like you're saying here, pulling up, uh, pulling up crabgrass, and three days later there's new roots on the ground. And so, it just doesn't make sense to me to take that approach. I mean, there's times when you're sort of in um, crisis mode and you have to just deal with what you got to deal with and clear what you can. But generally, like, you got to try to get over that hump. And if it's just like, let's say, let's say you have a whole bunch that's, it gets really weedy and you can't afford necessarily to take like a quarter of it or 20% of it out of production with a silage tarp. Yeah. Uh, that's where it gets tricky, right? So you're going to have to battle it and then maybe put a tarp on a new area, plant into that next spring, and then tarp one of the other blocks for the next summer. So farming isn't necessarily always a like direct this and now kind of thing. You always have to be thinking ahead, like just like your crop planning in terms of what, what you're going to plant next. You need to be planning about seasons, expansion, uh, weed control. This is all part of the farming process. It's all part of the bigger plan. And so, yes, right now can be very stressful. Uh, you know, right now we're in uh, mid to late June. And things are going quickly, including the weeds. And so we're seeing this right now in a lot of areas. It's already started. Like, we've been growing quickly for a while here, but maybe up further north than me, it's starting to pick up. And so people are starting to think about the weeds. And just remember that if you have a hard time this summer, think about what you're going to do for next year to plan ahead for that and how you're going to change your process. And then you'll be so much happier. <clears throat> um. Not Johnson grass. What do we have? The, we had a lot of nut sedge at um, Raleigh City Farm that was brutal. Like that stuff was like would grow through. We had a, we had a compost pile on our farm and it would grow through like six feet of compost. It was crazy. Um, that stuff needed like crazy amounts of tarping to kill. That stuff was crazy um, in terms of <laughs> vigorous and hardcore. So same chair. I do all this stuff. Um Tarping will kill everything with enough time, in, in my experience. Yep, eventually, if it doesn't have light, the plant will die. And as the plant, see, the plants take energy in from the sun. And so when they don't have um, energy from the sun, like if it's tarped and they're being occultated or blocked from light, they'll start using up energy that's stored in their roots. And eventually, there won't be any more energy there and they will die. But every plant will have a different amount of energy in their roots and be able to survive longer without light. <clears throat> yep, yep, yep. Hi, Simeon. Yes, uh, I mentioned this in the module for sure. Um, I have in the past... And this is actually a great strategy. Go to, definitely go check out the module too because I talk about this in depth. Um, landscape havoc with, full, with holes is great. Or even the like, I, I hate to say it, but that like one-time use plastic that you can punch holes into can be good. Um, especially in the first season, you, it allows you to tarp the ground using the landscape fabric or the plastic and occultate but still allows you to grow food in there. So you're kind of limited because you can't direct seed. You can only transplant. I know that uh, Daniel Mays, if you guys have seen his work before, Frith Farm, he's got an awesome book. Um, he had, I think in his book, or maybe when I was talking to him, I can't remember, he said like in his first season, they used a lot of plastic because they had just made their fields and their beds and they had a lot of weed pressure. And the only way they could deal with it was to tarp it, but they needed the ground to grow in. So that was their compromise. They just grew in landscape fabric with holes and they transplanted into them. And then after a year of that and layering materials and cover cropping and all the stuff that they do, they got rid of their weeds and they were able to do whatever they wanted in their beds. So yes, it can be a great strategy. Um, you're just more limited because you have to like grow certain crops. Once you have the landscape fabric with holes at certain spacings, you're kind of limited to that. And you can't direct seed. You can't do a lot of interplanting. But it's a great, like, compromise for sure. Uh, the other thing that's good about landscape fabric with holes is it actually keeps the soil cooler in the summer too. So that's an, another benefit. But, yes, absolutely, that's a that's a great strategy if you're trying to uh, sort of work around it while still growing. And the other benefit about that is that there's still active soil biology, right, because we're still pushing carbon into the ground with the plants that are growing. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, this definitely can work. 
Uh, Jack, our beds and walkways and our tunnels are clean around the perimeter of the tunnels is a jungle. Yes, that's definitely a concern, Jack. I talked about this in the module too. For me, I have, I'll call it a lawn, but it is definitely not like a lawn. It's like whatever's growing out there. There's some grass in there. And I hate mowing, you guys know. And sometimes the grass gets tall and seeds and then blows in. So your borders are super important. Make sure you have a lot of space between your beds and whatever else is going on. The more, the better. Cover it with wood chips, landscape fabric, um, other plants, things that are going to control that those things from blowing in. And the other thing that can help also is just regular mowing, like keeping things low so they don't go to seed. And anytime that I mow, if you have tunnels, yeah, tunnels in this case, put the sides down before you mow because the, the mower is going to eject all that material out and you want to keep that out of your beds. So I always put down the sides of my tunnels before I start mowing so that nothing blows in. So yes, all that stuff can creep in and cause problems. Um, you'll have stuff growing underground, you know, shooting out roots and then popping up or you'll have air blowing stuff from seeds. So yeah, definitely take care of the jungle <laughs> around your beds. Later days. Okay, so you rototill the bed. The weeds were crazy and it's never tilled. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... I mean, if you just think about what happens, like, it makes sense. But uh, it, it must have been cool for you to see that for sure. Uh... <laughs> hey, Blake. All right, so I guess this is about cutting out the sod. Yeah. So to me, like, if you're gonna spend that much time on it, like I try to figure out a way to make money and then buy a silage tarp. Like that's just my strategy. I, I will totally trade time for money because I can do other things. Um, and I just don't want to be out there busting my butt, just doing stuff like that. Um, that's my personal choice. Um, plus a silage tarp, you can use it over and over again. You can probably sell them too, used, I bet, if you use them. I'm sure you could sell them, but it's good to have a few around. Hey, Mike, uh, most valuable advice from the module for me was to keep my farm manageable in size so that if every weeds get out of hand, I manage it. Great point. You guys are bringing up all the good points from the module. So Mike brings up this point. I actually, this happened to me, what year was that, 2019? on the farm here and I was like so excited. I was growing food. I was like, oh, I'll just buy more compost, <laughs> make more beds. And then all of a sudden the farm was like way too big. Like in the middle of the summer when things start growing quickly and you gotta harvest it right when it's ready. And if you don't, it goes, it's too big and it's unharvestable. Um, and then weeds start growing in certain beds and you can't get through there and weed often enough. And then all of a sudden, the whole farm starts to deteriorate in terms of like the care that you can give it, the upkeep, um, making sure all the beds stay planted as often as you can. And then you get really stressed out and you can't think straight and you're like running around every day and you're like not, you're, you're rushing through things and not paying attention. This cycle happens to a lot of people, especially when they get started. I totally admit it happened to me. And so at one point I just covered I don't even remember. How, it was a bunch. It was maybe six beds. I just put landscape fabric down. And I was like, you know what? I don't need this because it's not helping me. At this point, it's hurting me because I'm just, I have too many beds that I can't keep up with. So I'm losing crops and then I'm struggling to plant them more and I'm more stressed out and the whole cycle repeated. So keeping it small and manageable is good and just being careful about the growth plan because it gets really tempting to just say, oh, we'll just plant a few more beds and we'll sell them. Well, then everything gets multiplied. The planting, the bed flipping, harvesting, the weeding, the irrigation, everything gets multiplied out. So, yeah, great, great point, Mike. Thanks for bringing that up. I think that happens to uh, to a lot of us and myself included. Hey, Lemon, I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but welcome. And let me just uh, give another shout out to Paper Pot Co. for sponsoring the course and the live Q&A sessions. So uh, big thanks to them. So go check out. Stuff they have for sale, tools, equipment, and supplies, and then uh, the other cool educational content coming out of Diego, like his podcast and his YouTube channel. So go check out what they have and then let them know you're enjoying the course. That'd be really cool. So thanks, Paper Pot. All right, uh, let's see here. Blake, 
Yes. Yeah, so rhizomatic issues. Exactly. So the further you keep everything away, uh, the better. You have less of a chance of things growing in for sure. But yeah, stuff will creep wherever it can. And, you know, if if it, there's like a whole bunch of area that's covered with plants and then only a few feet away there's an open bed with uh, fresh soil, like it's going to go over there and want to grow, you know? So, uh, yeah, more of a border is great. All right, let's see here. All right, so get some more questions in uh, about uh, weed management, and then we'll open up for general questions like usual. But, of course, if you have questions about weed management and we're talking about general stuff, make sure you toss that in too. All right, let's see here. How long your tarps last? I was quite unlucky, and my first two small tarps had defects, so I'm being extra careful. Ooh. Um, let's see. The We had – I mean, I bought – I haven't – the first tarp – I actually bought for myself was like last year for here. So I, I, I don't remember how many years they're rated for, maybe five ish. Uh, but it really will depend on how you drag them around on the farm. It's really easy to rip them. If you're not paying attention, um, they could get snagged on a bed stake on a rock on a tool uh, you just have to be really careful uh, when you're rolling them out and moving them around because they're very heavy too. And especially if there's any moisture on them or any soil, they get really heavy and they're hard to move. Always have another set of hands or a couple sets of hands to um, to move the tarps around. That's huge. I also just ordered another tarp um, and I noticed on the Farmer's Friend site that they had uh, plastic, uh, they had tape for <coughs> for patching landscape fabric. It's like UV rated or whatever. I don't know what the deal is with it, but I saw it. I, I don't think I'd ever seen that before. So that's an option too. I guess you can patch it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. We had some old tarps at Raleigh City Farm that were there from before I was there and they were still fine. I don't know how old they were. Also keeping them out of the sun when you're not using them would be really helpful. Like plastic breaks down in the sun. So if you can... Keep them stored somewhere else when you're not using them. That would be helpful too. So you six foot landscape for African waters. Yeah, six foot or more. <clears throat> um, yeah, the more the better. So yeah, like around around my around my plants or around my tunnels. On one side, I have that main walkway where the compost and the tools are. That's all wood chip. There's no plants over there. And then on the bottom side, there's that hedgerow. It has like a three and a half foot ditch and then a two feet and then a four foot hedgerow. So there's like like 10 feet there. On the bottom side, there's that whole other hedgerow thing. The top actually grows in easier than I thought. We didn't leave enough of a border. There. It's like a ditch and then that area with the um, raised bed. So that's a little bit tighter. So some of that can blow in. So the more, the better for a border, for sure. Um, and if you can't cover it with landscape fabric or wood chips, just make sure you're mowing it often and just keeping it low to the ground. That also will go a long way. And just make sure you're not shooting the material into your beds. All right. It looks like we're getting to general questions. That's totally cool. If you have questions about weed management, make sure you get them in. Should I build or buy hoop houses and enter caterpillar tunnels? Buy tunnels. I do not build them. It is just not worth your time. The, the kits are the same price or maybe even cheaper. Um, and they the amount of time that you have to spend sourcing materials, figuring it out, it's just just buy them, <laughs> put them together. I'm a big fan of the Farmer's Friend tunnels. Um, they're quick and easy to set up. I don't know if they're shipping to Canada. Um, but there's I think there's a couple other companies in Canada. At least they were trying to. Um, I'm sure they shipped to Canada. Those are great. Um, I have three of them. I have the uh, Gothic Pros. I also have a tunnel from Rimmel. They make uh, really beefy greenhouses there in New Hampshire, so they make everything to be like snow, snow ready. That tunnel took forever to build. It was so so much more to it. A very different kind of uh, tunnel than the Caterpillar tunnels, but <clears throat> I highly recommend buying a kit for sure. Uh, do you put sandbags on the tarp for the wind? Absolutely. Sandbags, wood, um, stones, uh, T posts, like whatever you have. And you cannot overdo it because I feel like we never had 
<laughs> had enough weight on the on the tarps. If you don't put the tarps down, a breeze comes and they're going to be across the field. At Royal City Farm, we had like crazy winds always coming in over that softball field, and so we always had to put like a ton of weight on there. It never seemed like enough. Um, so yeah, definitely got to put weight on it. Hey Johnson, when will we think of replacing the tunnel poly? So it says four years. Um, right, it's four year six mil plastic. I probably won't worry for a while. Now, the thing about the the time on the plastic is it's probably not going to, um, like break down to like create a hole or something. It just will get hazier and like lose transmission, is what I understand. So again, it's not like on and off. It's not like next next year it's gonna like not let any light through. So you have to sort of see about your plants are doing and stuff. Um, I think you'll know. I think it also depends on the kind of weather and how beat up they are, and you know if you are if you do have rips and holes or anything like that. But I'm I'm definitely a few years off. Hello from Greece. Yeah, so if I just saw that, um, which is interesting. I, I need to go check out the details. Actually, Jonathan said he's going to send me one. I totally forgot to follow up with him. They actually sent me a prototype of this like last year, which I've been using all for last year, and I gave them a bunch of feedback on it. So I think a lot of things I recommended became part of the new plan. So <laughs> you're welcome. Hopefully they, they put out a good kit. I'm sure they did. They do a great job with what they do. Um yeah, it's very similar to a lot of the other kits that are out there. One thing they have is um, uh, the blower motor that they use is cool because it works with a button um, that's air-driven and not electric-driven, so you can't shock yourself. Um, I don't know if they're using the same pump they sent me, but the one I, they sent me, the, the button stopped working. Um, but I've still been using it. So, yeah, I mean, it's there's nothing, like, crazy unique about these kits. I, I I don't know. I think they have a new drain system that looks cool. I need to get that and probably install that. Um, i got to get in touch with them. But, yeah, that's cool they're offering that for sure. And I and the, this, week, this week coming up is going to be about composting, but the module the following week is going to be about the wash station, so I'll show you what I have going on too and give you some ideas. But a lot of it is DIY anyways because you still have to put the PVC together and all that kind of stuff for the manifold. Uh, wood chips or straw in the pathways for weed control. So I like wood chips, but you know straw works too. Wood chips last longer. Uh, I think they're a little less messy. Um, actually, I don't know, but I think they last longer. So I probably use wood chips if you have them. A hey, journeyman collective bulb type weeds that survive much longer tarps. Same process. I just tarp until everything's dead. That. I don't I don't like think about all the different things. I'd put down the tarp. Sorry. Before I put down the tarp, let me back up. If you have to till, do that. If you have to move land around, terrace, ditches, all that stuff, do that. Water it down really good and then cover with the tarp. And it works better in the warmer months because then it'll force things, everything to grow. If you pull it back and you see stuff growing, put the cover back on. Make sure everything's dead, dead, dead. Um... It could take up to a year, depending on what you have growing and and your temperature. So it's one of those things where, as I was saying earlier in this Q&A, is that if you are planning on expanding the farm like next season, get the tarp down now. Just give it as much time as you can. Some people will even build beds. So like if you're wanting to work more with the native soil and you don't want to bring in like deep compost mulch system and maybe your soil is fine, a lot of people what they do is they'll shape the beds Right, so they'll either like rotary plow the the walkways into the beds, or use a shovel or whatever, or use a um a tractor to go through and shape your beds, and then water it down and then tarp it, and then when you pull off the tarp, you have beds and no weeds. So that's another option too, um, but it takes as long as it takes. That's as I said, like we're working against nature here in this case, so we're we can't control we can't control that. We got to just work with it. Sandbags for tarps, yep. Yes, <laughs> not sharp rocks. I've been using sand in mine, but like river stone, stuff like that would work well too. <laughs> yeah, water bottles in the summer and the winter won't work great. All 
All right, with irrigation, it's a moving target, absolutely. Generally water more than back off or creep your volume up to where you want. Well, generally I'd say I'm underwatering because at the beginning of the season, it doesn't need a lot of water. So I'll go up there one day and then and go, okay, it needs more water. So I'll turn the irrigation on for a set amount of time, let it run for a couple of days, check it. Usually I can tell if it's over underwater right away and then make adjustments. And then as the season creeps up, you know, you'll have your timer set a certain way. We're talking about in tunnels here because if you're growing out in the field, then when it rains, it throws everything off anyways. But if you're in tunnels where the moisture is pretty consistent in there, then as it starts to warm up throughout the season, you'll go out there and you'll go, whoa, there's not enough moisture in there. So I'll bump it up and then I'll check in a couple days or in a day or two and then make adjustments from there. So again, moving target. Then once you get past the, the, winter, the summer solstice into the fall and things start slowing down, you'll go out there and you go, oh, there's too much water. And then you'll dial back the, 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 the timers. Hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of a natural process throughout the year where you're kind of over under. Or if uh, you get a bunch, like in the middle of the summer, if you get a, a cooler streak and you have a bunch of cloudy, rainy days and you realize it's it's just really too wet in there, you just turn the, turn the timers off for a few days and then when it gets sunny and warm again, just kick them back on. That's kind of my strategy. All right. I'm flying through questions today. Uh, cardboard with wood chips on top are awesome for pathways. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you didn't tarp ahead of time and put down cardboard and you just need to get your walkways under control and you want to mulch, absolutely. Yeah. Put down some cardboard and then cover it with wood chips. And then, you know, usually I say like cover, uh, wet the cardboard down when I'm, when you're doing deep compost mulch system. But if you're just using it for a pathway, you don't want it to break down. So I would just put down cardboard and then put down the wood chips and then you don't have to, uh, They'll, it'll last longer. It'll give you more weed control. I have no idea on that number. I, I I have no idea because I just, I set a timer for so many minutes and then I check the soil. So I have no idea, unfortunately. You are very welcome. Cool, Blake. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't like think about it. I just kind of just make adjustments on the fly. Um... You know, there's just no set it and forget it with farming, especially when you use timers. You're like, oh, it's good. And then you go out there and it's like way too much water, not enough water. So definitely got to make sure you're uh, you're checking it out. Oh, nice, Brian. <laughs> How's that going for you? Yeah, living pathways are cool. Um, I'd like to chat with Jesse more about it. Um, I was out there last year when he just started it. And so he was really experimenting with it. But I think he's like, he's just all in love with it now. So if you guys don't know what this is, this is about like actually the pathways are covered with cover crop, grass. Like I think Jesse told me last, he's like, yeah, I just let, let grow what grows and then I just keep cutting it. It's another thing to manage. You have to mow it. He uses like a little electric mower that's it's not quite the right width, so he has to make two passes. But um, there's a lot of benefit to it because you get more photosynthesis going on, more soil life. Um, it also looks really cool. Um, it's also softer on your knees if you're kneeling than wood chips, which can be harsh if, unless you're wearing like knee pads or whatever. Um, Jesse loves it. So hopefully it's going well for you, Brian. I think there's a lot more experimenting with uh, living pathways and different systems. And I don't know, it's really cool for sure. I couldn't imagine doing it in my tunnel, but. Will 50% clay floss still let lettuce grow in the summer? So 50% is a lot. Um, when you're growing, most of the time when you're doing crops like that, you want to only use shade cloth for the first week or two to get them acclimated and then you can remove it. That's usually what people do with shade cloth and, and with lettuce and stuff like that. If you don't, they'll probably get really leggy and not look good and stretch out, um, cause they won't have enough light. So usually I would probably... Get the landscape, get the shade cloth on them for the first like week um, just to get them happy while they settle in because there's a lot of shock going on and it's going to be really hot for them out there and a lot of and full sunlight. So that's generally what people do and then remove the shade cloth. Nice, nice. <laughs> 
You know, I want an electric mower. I want an electric riding mower. That's what I really want. I don't know. Last I looked in them, they're very expensive. That'd be super cool though. <clears throat> if anyone works for an electric riding mower company and want to send me one, let me know. We'll have to try it. Um, <laughs> all right. So what other questions do you guys have? Your season's going all right. Hopefully weeds and pests are slightly under control. You have a heat strategy. Excuse me. What are cover crops are easy to terminate with tarps? I'd say most of them. Um, I'd say some are quicker than others. I think a lot of people will either mow them down or crimp them and then cover with the tarp just to give a, a little bit more termination. Some will take longer than others for sure. And of course, time of the year. All right, so get the last couple questions in. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Let's see. Thursday will be um, composting. That'll be module 17. 18 and 19 are going to be about the wash pack station and harvesting and selling uh, your, your produce. And that'll be it, guys. So the course will be over. And uh, we'll wrap it up. It'll be 19 modules altogether. And uh, I will not be doing weekly Q&As after that, but... Take advantage of the next few weeks. If you have questions and you want to get in touch with me, uh, it's a great time to come and chat and hang out. <clears throat> uh, I am excited about the composting module. I just, I'm a little behind on my filming. I filmed it today, so I'll get that up for Thursday. Um, it's really cool. I, I'm, I'm not a big composter. I don't know enough about it to like be an expert or a guru, guru, but it's been fun. I've learned a lot and uh, it's just cool to see everything break down and turn into soil. That's really neat, so. All right. More questions? I'll hang out for a little while. I kind of flew through everything quickly today, but. All right, well, it's cool with me. Uh, <laughs> anyways, if you have further questions, come to the next few weeks. Let me know. Hopefully your summers are going well and uh, staying cool out there. Remember, don't push yourself too hard. Drink a lot of water. Cover yourself up. Wear a big hat, all that kind of stuff. It gets important through the summer. Um, it's tough for sure. So thanks for coming in today. Thanks for all the support. Appreciate it. We'll see you guys uh, next week. But, of course, you'll see me on Thursday for the next module.